Hello, I'm Phoenix City Council Member Carlos Garcia with District 8. We will never replace in-person teaching, but during these trying times, our children still need to continue to learn. The City of Phoenix is proud to partner with both the Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts to bring you Phoenix TV Classroom Study Hall. Youth and education is a priority for Phoenix. That's why the city is bringing you the study hall to your home during this next hour right here on Phoenix TV. Learning should never stop, so get ready for class. Here's the study hall. My name is Stephanie Acosta and I'm the principal at Ed and Verma Pastor Elementary School in the Roosevelt School District in Phoenix, Arizona. I'd like to read for you today one of my favorite stories. It's by Kevin Hanks and it's called Chrysanthemum. The day she was born was the happiest day in her parents' lives. She's perfect, said her mother. Absolutely, said her father. And she was. She was absolutely perfect. Her name must be everything she is, said her mother. Her name must be absolutely perfect, said her father. And it was Chrysanthemum. Her parents named her Chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum grew and grew and grew. And when she was old enough to appreciate it, Chrysanthemum loved her name. She loved the way it sounded when her mother woke her up. She loved the way it sounded when her father called her for dinner. And she loved the way it sounded when she whispered it to herself in the bathroom mirror. Chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum loved the way her name looked when it was written in ink on an envelope. She loved the way it looked when it was written with icing on her birthday cake. And she loved the way it looked when she wrote it herself with her fat orange crayon. Chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum thought her name was absolutely perfect. And then she started school. On the first day, Chrysanthemum wore her sunniest dress and her brightest smile. And she ran all the way. Hooray, said Chrysanthemum, school. But when Mrs. Chud took roll call, everyone giggled upon hearing Chrysanthemum's name. It's so long, said Joe. It scarcely fits on your name tag, said Rita, pointing. I'm named after my grandmother, said Victoria. You're named after a flower. Chrysanthemum wilted. She did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She thought it was absolutely dreadful. The rest of the day was not much better. During nap time, Victoria raised her hand and informed Mrs. Chud that Chrysanthemum's name was spelled with 13 letters. That's exactly half as many letters as there are in the entire alphabet explained Victoria. Thank you for sharing with us, Victoria, said Mrs. Chud. Now put your head down. If I had a name like yours, I'd change it, Victoria said. As the students lined up to go home, I wish I could, thought Chrysanthemum, miserably. Welcome home, said her mother. Welcome home, said her father. School is no place for me, said Chrysanthemum. My name is too long. It scarcely fits on my name tag, and I'm named after a flower. Oh, Pish, said her mother, your name is beautiful, and precious, and priceless, and fascinating, and winsome, said her father. It's everything you are, said mother. Absolutely perfect, said her father. 
Chrysanthemum felt much better after her favorite dinner, macaroni and cheese with ketchup, and an evening filled with hugs, kisses, and parcheesi. That night, Chrysanthemum dreamt that her name was Jane. It was an extremely pleasant dream. The next morning, Chrysanthemum wore her most comfortable jumper. She walked to school as slowly as she could. She dragged her feet in the dirt. Chrysanthemum, 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 she wrote. She even looks like a flower, said Victoria, as Chrysanthemum entered the playground. Let's pick her, said Rita, pointing. Let's smell her, said Joe. Chrysanthemum wilted. She did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She thought it was absolutely dreadful. The rest of the day was not much better. During nap time, Victoria raised her hand and said, a chrysanthemum is a flower. It lives in a garden with worms and other dirty things. Thank you for sharing that with us, Victoria, said Mrs. Chud. Now put your head down. I just cannot believe your name, Victoria said as the students lined up to go home. Neither can I, thought Chrysanthemum miserably. Welcome home, said mother. Welcome home, said father. School is no place for me, said Chrysanthemum. They said I even look like a flower and they pretended to pick me and smell me. Oh, pish, said her mother. They're just jealous and envious and begrudging and discontented and jaundiced, said her father. Who wouldn't be jealous of a name like yours, said her mother. After all, it's absolutely perfect, said her father. Chrysanthemum felt a trifle better after her favorite dessert, chocolate cake with buttercream frosting, and another evening filled with hugs and kisses and parcheesi. That night, Chrysanthemum dreamt that she really was a chrysanthemum, that she sprouted leaves and petals. Victoria picked her and plucked the leaves and petals one by one until there was nothing left but a scrawny stem. It was the worst nightmare of Chrysanthemum's life. Chrysanthemum wore her outfit with seven pockets the next morning. She loaded the pockets with her most prized possessions and her good luck charms. Chrysanthemum took the longest route possible to school. She stopped and stared at each and every flower. Chrysanthemum, 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 the flower seemed to say. That morning, the students were introduced to Mrs. Twinkle, the music teacher. Her voice was like something out of a dream, as was everything else about her. The students were speechless. They thought Mrs. Twinkle was an indescribable wonder. They went out of their way to make a nice impression. Mrs. Twinkle led the students in scales, and then she assigned roles for the class musical. Victoria was chosen as the dainty fairy queen. Rita was chosen as the spiffy butterfly princess. Joe was chosen as the all-important pixie messenger. And Chrysanthemum was chosen as a daisy. Chrysanthemum's a daisy! Chrysanthemum's a daisy! Joe, Rita, and Victoria chanted, thinking it was wildly funny. Chrysanthemum wilted. She did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She thought it was absolutely dreadful. What's so humorous, said Mrs. Twinkle. Chrysanthemum was the answer. Her name is so long, said Joe. It scarcely fits on her name tag, said Rita, pointing. I'm named after my grandmother, said Victoria. She's named after a flower. My name is Long, said Mrs. Twinkle. It is, said Joe. My name would scarcely fit on a name tag, said Mrs. Twinkle. It would, said Rita, pointing. And, said Mrs. Twinkle, 
I am named after a flower too. You are, said Victoria? Yes, said Mrs. Twinkle. My name is Delphinium. Delphinium Twinkle. And if I have a baby girl, I'm considering chrysanthemum as a name. It's absolutely perfect. Chrysanthemum could scarcely believe her ears. She blushed, she beamed, she bloomed. Chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum. Joe, Rita, and Victoria looked at chrysanthemum longingly. Call me Marigold, said Joe. I'm Carnation, said Rita, pointing. My name is Lily of the Valley, said Victoria. Chrysanthemum did not think her name was absolutely perfect. She knew it. Epilogue. Overall, the class musical was a huge success. Chrysanthemum was absolutely perfect as a daisy. Victoria made the only mistake. She forgot her lines as the dainty fairy queen. Chrysanthemum thought it was wildly funny and she giggled throughout the entire dance of the flowers. Eventually, Mrs. Twinkle gave birth to a healthy baby girl and of course, she named her Chrysanthemum. I hope you enjoyed the story. It's one of my favorites. Our next story is a favorite as well. It's called Gila Monsters Meet You at the Airport. It's by Marjorie Weinman Charmet, and the pictures are by Byron Barton. I live at 165 East 95th Street, New York City, and I'm going to stay here forever. My mother and father are moving out west. They say I have to go too. They say I can't stay here forever. Out west, nobody plays baseball because they're too busy chasing buffaloes. And there's cactus everywhere you look. But if you don't look, you have to stand up just as quickly as you sat down. Out west, it takes 15 minutes to say hello. Like this. Howdy, partner. Out west, I'll look silly all the time. I'll have to wear chaps and spurs and a bandana and a hat so big that no one can find me underneath it. I'll have to ride a horse to school every day and I don't know how. Out west, everybody grows up to be a sheriff and I want to be a subway driver. My best friend is Seymour, and we like to eat salami sandwiches together. Out west, I probably won't have any friends, but if I do, they'll be named Tex or Slim. And we'll eat chili and beans for breakfast and lunch and dinner while I miss Seymour and salami. I'm on my way out west. It's cool in the airplane. The desert is so hot, you can collapse and then the buzzards will circle overhead. But no one rescues you because it's real life and not the movies. There are clouds out the window, but no buzzards yet. I'm looking at a map. Before, whenever I looked at a map, I always knew my house was to the right, but no more. Now I'm in the middle of that map and I'm going left, left, out west. Seymour says there are Gila monsters and horned toads out west. And I read it in a book, so I know it's so. But Seymour says they meet you at the airport. We're here. Out west. I don't know what a Gila monster or a horned toad looks like, but I don't think I see them at the airport. 
I see a boy in a cowboy hat. He looks like Seymour, but I know his name is Tex. Hi, I say. Hi, he says. I'm moving east. Great, I say. Great, he says. What's so great about it? Don't you know that the streets are full of gangsters and they all wear flowers in the lapels so that they look honest? But they zoom around in big cars and screeching brakes? You have to jump out of their way. In the east, it snows and blows all the time except for five minutes when it's spring and summer? And you have to live on the 50th floor and airplanes fly through your bedroom and you have to duck fast? They ran out of extra space in the East a long time ago. It's so crowded, people sit on top of each other when they ride to work. And alligators live in the sewers. I read it in a book, so I know it's so. Then the mother and father of the boy who looks like Seymour but isn't grab his hand and off he goes. Sometimes the alligators get out, he yells to me and they wait for you at the airport. It's warm, but there's a nice breeze. We're in a taxi, riding to my new house. No horses yet. I don't see any buffalo stampedes either. I see a restaurant, just like the one in my old neighborhood. I see some kids playing baseball. I see a horse. Hey, that's a great looking horse. I'm going to ask my mother and father for one just like it. Here's our house. Some kids are riding their bikes in front of it. I hope one of them is named Slim. Tomorrow, I'm writing a long letter to Seymour. I'll tell him I'm sending it by Pony Express. Seymour will believe me. Back East, they don't know much about us Westerners. Good morning, students. I'm Michael Roberts, superintendent of the Osborne School District in Central Phoenix. And I'm Quentin Boyd, superintendent of the Roosevelt School District in South Phoenix. We're pleased to have this partnership with the City of Phoenix to take Phoenix students on a new learning adventure right here on Phoenix TV. Just because our school buildings are closed doesn't mean the learning stops. We have the best, most creative teachers from Roosevelt and Osborne School Districts on board to provide you with a great learning experience. Okay, students, that's the bell. So the Phoenix TV Study Hall resumes. Here is your next lesson. Hey, friends. My name is Mrs. Davey. I am a dual language kindergarten teacher in the Osborne District here in Phoenix. I am a Solano Tiger. Go Tigers! Rawr. Today I'm here to read a book to you and it is called Do Not Lick This Book. It's full of germs. It was written by Aiden Ben Barak and Julian Frost. Before I read this book to you, I want you to think about what you already know about germs. Thinking about what we know about germs. Turn on your thinking brain. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds. Ready? Okay. Yeah, keep thinking. Almost out of time. Today we are talking about all sorts of germs. Now, how do we see germs? Yeah, we have to have a special tool. That tool is called a microscope. This is a microscope. Now, a microscope is a special tool. It helps you see things that are really small and it makes them look bigger. This is a very basic microscope. It was loaned to me by a friend. Thank you, scientific mom. Now take a look at your hands. They look pretty clean, right? I don't see any dirt on these hands, but 
I'm going to show you what happens when we touch things around our house. Imagine all the things in your house that you touch with your hands. At your house, would you touch a ball or a computer? Oh, maybe a delicious piece of sandia, some watermelon. Oh, when you flush the toilet, you might touch colored pencils or an apple. Do you have any other ideas? Really? I know that I touch lots of things at my house. My hands touch the doorknobs, they touch the light switches, they touch my face sometimes. Sometimes they even touch my feet when I'm putting on my socks or my shoes. My hands touch all sorts of things. Today, I'm going to do an experiment by touching this bag of germs. I don't see anything on my hands. They look clean. Do they look clean to you? Wait, look closer. Do you see anything on my hands? Well, I sure don't. I have a special light to use. By touching the bag of germs and then touching things around my house, if I turn on the special light and I turn off the lights where I live, I can see what it looks like <gasps> when I spread, oh my goodness, germs. Wait, this light switch looks clean. I had no idea I was spreading things all over my house. I wonder, how can I solve this problem? I'm a little worried that I am spreading germs. You know, I'm going to think about it, but first let's learn something new about germs. By reading, do not lick this book. It's full of germs. It was written by Idan Ben Barak and Julian Frost illustrated while Linnea Rundgren photographed through a, yep, microscope. When we're finished, we're going to come back and we're going to think about how to solve that big problem of me getting things all over my house by touching things with my hands. Hmm, I wonder what all this green stuff is. You know, it kind of looks like spaghetti, but I'm not sure. Do not lick this book. It's full of germs. Eden, Ben Barak, and Julian Frost, Scanning Electron Microscope by Linnea Lundgren. This is Min. Min is a microbe. She's small, very small. Can you see this dot? Microbes are so small that 3,422,167 of them could fit on it. Wait a second, I just made a connection. Microscope and microbes, they both start with the same beginning sounds. Microscope, microbes. Huh, I'm hearing micro in both of those words. Microbes live everywhere in the air, in your intestines, in your sock, on trumpets, in Arctica, at the bottom of the sea, on elephants' knees, just over there, underground, in your breakfast, inside this fish, on top of Mount Everest, up Santa's nose. Min lives in this book, and if you could look really, really closely, wow. you'd see her. Oh my goodness. She's so small. This is a photo of paper really, really close up. I'm bored. Let's take Min on an adventure. See the circle on the next page? That's where Min lives. 
Touch the circle with your finger to pick her up. Do you think you've got her? Min is now on your finger. Away we go! Where shall we take Min first? Take me to your teeth. Okay, let's go. Open your mouth and carefully touch your front teeth with your finger. Now let's look really, really closely. Did you touch your teeth? This is a photo of a tooth really, really close up. How many germs do you see on this tooth? Whoa, this place is weird. I'm Min. What are you guys up to? I'm Ray. We're digging cavities. Want to help? Can I get some acid over here? Yuck, can you smell toothpaste? Hey kid, brush your teeth less and eat more candy. What a strange place teeth are when you look really, really closely. No wonder it's a good idea to brush them. It's time for Min's next adventure. Touch your teeth to pick Min up. Looks like you've picked up Ray as well. Where shall we go next? Would you like to visit a shirt, Ray? Shirt! All right, let's explore your shirt. Put your finger on your shirt to send Min and Ray on a new adventure. Now let's look really, really closely. Oh, wait a second. This is a photo of fabric really, really close up. How many new germs do you see on this page? I'm Min, and this is Ray. We're on an adventure. Adventure! Nice to meet you. My name's Dennis. We're making this shirt smell. Gross! I found a clean patch. Dennis, there's some lovely filth down here. Can you give me a hand spreading this dirt around? What's a hand? I hope we don't get put in the wash for a few more days. What a strange place shirts are when you look really, really closely. No wonder they need washing. Now it's time for Min and Ray's next adventure. Touch your shirt to pick them up. Dennis has come along for the ride. We have time for one more trip. Where shall we go? Shall we visit a belly button, Dennis? What's a belly button? Okay, off we go. Put your finger in your belly button and wiggle it about. Now, let's look really, really closely. This is a photo of skin really, really close up. How many new germs do you see on this page? Hello, we're Min, Ray, and Dennis. I'm Jake. Welcome. We don't get many visitors. Help yourselves to a delicious chunk of dead skin. Uh, I do enjoy a nice drink of sweat on a hot day. Did I tell you about the time soap got all the way in here? I don't like scary stories. What a strange place skin is when you look really, really closely. No wonder it gets itchy. Put your finger back in your belly button to pick up Min and her friends. This shirt is weird. I'm Ray! That was fun. Now I'd like to go back to my book, please. Can we come? What's a book? Let's put Min and her friends back in this book. Hey, look who's on the tip of your finger. Here's a good spot. There's plenty of room for everyone. Hmm, ready to put them back? Where will you take Min tomorrow? There she is, and Ray, and Jake, and Dennis. Jake's got a book. I wonder what Jake's reading. All right, everybody, let's take a stretch. Go ahead and stand up. Let's roll our shoulders back. Two, three, and four. Forward, two, three, and four. Let's reach up with our left arm. 
Let's reach up with our right arm. Let's go ahead and squeeze our shoulders up to our ears. Go. And let it go. And one more time. And let it go. All right, let's tip our chin down to our chest. One, two, three, four, five. And let's make our head go over to the left side. One, two, three, four, five. Keep those shoulders down and roll it forward. And to your right side. One, two, three, four, five. And back to the front. One, two, three, four, five. And bring it back up. Taking a big deep breath. Go ahead and let it out. It's hard to sit for very long, isn't it? That's okay. We get up and we stretch our bodies. And now our brains are ready to think a little bit more before our lesson is done today. Now we're ready to read the last few pages. What microbes really look like. Microbes are so small that nobody knew they even existed until microscopes were invented. They come in all sorts of odd shapes, but they don't have faces, feet, or hands, and they can't really talk. Sorry, Min. Min is an E. coli. E. coli live happily in your intestines, but they are very good at spreading, especially when you don't wash your hands too well. That's me? What do you mean I don't have eyes or a mouth? Ray is a streptococcus. Streptococcus bacteria live in lots of places, including your mouth, eating sugar, and pooping acid that can dissolve your teeth. I'm all bumpy. Dennis is a fungus. His real name is Aspergillus niger. You probably picked him up while playing outside. Nice hairstyle. Jake is a Corinibacterium. Corinibacterium live in lots of places, including your skin. They're big fans of dirt. I wish I had legs in real life, too what the people who made this book look like. Iden Ben Barak, Julian Frost, Linnea Rundgren. Hmm. This wasn't spaghetti, was it? Do you remember what it was? Ooh, look. If you really must lick this book, please do it here. <laughs> What did you remember about germs? Take a moment and tell someone close to you, or if there's nobody near you right now, you can tell your thumb, you can tell a stuffed animal, you could tell your pet. All right. Now, we thought about what we already know about germs. We read our book. Do not lick this book. It's full of germs. And we learned that there are special names for different types of germs and that the science word for a germ is a microbe. Say microbe with me, ready? Microbe. All right, so we learned about E. coli, we learned about streptococcus, we learned about fungus, and we learned about corn. Ay, 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 this one's a hard one. I better break it down. Corinibacterium. Corinibacterium. I'm going to check that and make sure that I'm right before I put it into the video. Now, micro means very very small. So it makes sense that a microscope is something you can look through to see things that are small and make them look larger because we know that microbes are very, very small. And we learned that by reading our book today. I love microscopes. I have one in my classroom that I've used with my students. We like to collect things on our playground and then look at them through the microscope. We learned that microbes can be seen through a microscope. We also learned that we have microbes all around us 
in our belly buttons, on our shirts, on our skin, in our teeth, on our books. There are germs everywhere. So if we want to keep germs from making us sick, we have to think about what to do. Do you have any ideas? Since you probably don't have a bag of germs at home, you could use a little bit of flour. You could find some baby powder, or you might even have some glitter in the house. Whatever you decide to use, once you have some on your hands, walk around and touch a few things to see what it looks like after you've touched it. Does it remind you of germs? After you've touched a few things around the house, it's time to get that stuff off your hands. But what to do? You can follow the steps of the Scrub Club crew. Scrub Club fans, now do your part. Wet your hands right from the start. Slick the soap. The turtles slide off. You don't want to sneeze. Oh. Now scrub your hands and fingers too. Have some patience, Scrub Club crew. Water will carry the germs away. Rinse your hands the Scrub Club way. Buff your hands all dry and clean. Those germs are gone. Good job, team. Carrie tells you to get your hands wet. Slick says add some soap. Patience says scrub for 20 seconds and Buff says dry those hands. I hope you've learned something new today about germs and how we can keep ourselves safe. Be well. I wish you well. I will see you next time. Have a great day. For more information, you can visit the National Science Foundation's Scrub Club. Welcome to first and second grade science. My name is Ms. Soto. I am a second grade teacher at Cesar Chavez in the Roosevelt School District. A fun fact about me is I love Dr. Seuss books and I love to drink coffee. Let's get started. Today we'll be learning about germs. We will be learning about what germs are, how they're spread, and how we can help to help stop the spread. Let's talk about what germs are. Germs are tiny organisms that are all around us. They live in our houses, in our playgrounds, in parks, in stores, and I bet if you haven't washed your hands yet, they're living in your hands right now. They can make us sick. They can stop us from going to school, stop us from going to work, and stop us from doing daily things. They're a real bummer. They are so small you can't see them. That is the tricky thing about germs. They're invisible to our eyes, unless we have a special tool such as a microscope that will help us see them better. Now that you learned what germs are, I would like to show you some three simple rules to knock out germs. Let's start off with number one. Number one, build your immune system. How can we do that? By drinking a lot of water, eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, and also by keeping active. Number two, Wash your hands with soap and water. Now, it is very important to keep our hands clean because our germs enter our body through our hands. You need to remember to, to wash with soap and water. And also what I like to say is to sing the happy birthday song two times for you to make sure that you get the inside of your hands, the outside, and in between your fingers. Number three, keep your germs to yourself. Have you ever sneezed? I'm pretty sure you have. Are you sneezing the correct way? Are you sneezing into your hands? Wrong. You need to sneeze into the crook of your elbow right here. So when you sneeze, it comes to your elbow and then you wash your hands with soap and water. This will help you avoid spreading your own germs to other people. I have chosen a great book for us to read today. It is called Sick Simon by Dan Crawl. This book reinforces the importance of washing our hands to avoid spreading germs to others when we are sick. Sick Simon by Dan Crawl. Let's get started. It was Monday. Simon didn't care if he had a cold. He was ready for the best week ever. As you can tell, Simon has a runny nose and he doesn't look very healthy to me. Let's find out what happens. 
He kissed his family good morning and had his favorite breakfast. Well, as you can tell in the first picture, he's giving a kiss to all his family, but they all look very healthy in the first picture. But if you look at the bottom picture, they all look very sick after getting a kiss from Simon. It looks like he spread his germs to his family already. He rode the bus to school and had fun the whole way. Well, it looks like he had fun, but it doesn't look like the other kids are having fun. It looks like his germs are already spreading in the bus. It looks like there's someone throwing out outside of the bus and they all look very scared and he looks very sick. School was Simon's favorite place. Well, he still looks very sick, but it looks like he made it to school, but I don't think that's a very good idea. He already got his parents very sick. He got the kids in the bus very sick. I can just imagine what he's gonna do to everybody else in the school. Math was Simon's best subject, so he was sure to participate a lot. Oh no, achoo! It looks like he sneezed and he didn't cover his mouth at all. He just let all his germs fly everywhere. On Tuesday, Simon got to take care of Mr. Warvels, the class chinchilla. Share snacks with friends and have a show and tell. Well, I feel sorry for that chinchilla because it looks like his runny nose is coming to the food. Ugh. Also, he shares snacks with his friends, but he's also touching them with his hands. And I don't think he's washed his hands because I can see the germs on his hands as you can tell from his runny nose. Oh no, I don't think that's very safe. Also, in the show and tell, if you ever had a show and tell in your classroom, you know that the show and tell item is passed around for everybody to look at. And if that show and tell item has germs, everybody's gonna get them in their hands. Uh oh. Wednesday's field trip was a treat. Well, do you see the teacher and all the students? They all look very sick. I feel like Simon already got everybody sick. The monkeys are even scared to get sick in that picture. Although recess on Thursday was a blast, well, I don't know about you, but that doesn't look like a blast to me. They all look very sick and none of them had a lot of energy either. What Simon was really looking forward to, if you can look at the whiteboard over here, it says Miss Lewinsky is sick. Now we're sick. gonna find out what Simon was really looking forward to. And that was Friday's super big game of kickball. It looks like he's the only one on the field. I wonder where everybody else is. On the way home, Simon started thinking maybe this wasn't the best week after all. Hey, Simon, nice work this week. You're the man. What? Who are you guys? Do you know who's talking to Simon right there? It's the germs. We're germs and we make people sick. Not to brag, but I'm virus and I make people vomit. Pertoza here. Diarrhea is my thing. I'm bacteria, I do infections, and we couldn't go anywhere without you. Oh no, that's what they're telling to Simon. Have a nice trip, everyone. Thanks for the ride. Cuff, hack, hack. So as you can tell, Simon didn't cover his hand too well, and they're thanking him for giving them a ride. He's spreading more germs now on the bus. He didn't cover his mouth again. Oh, Simon. After that, we're everywhere. On the doorknob, on the railing, in the air, around people that are sick. And that's how the magic happens. The magic is that everybody's sick because Simon spread his germs everywhere. He wasn't very careful when he was sick. Huh? What? I don't spread.
spread you guys around? Are you kidding? You never wash your hands. You never cover your mouth. You sneeze on everything. You love spreading germs. Are they wrong? They're not. You're a germ hero. The germs have named Simon their hero because he doesn't get rid of them. He just spreads them around. Oh, wow. Do you see how the germs are really living with all the skits in the school? Because Simon has spread his germs all around the school. Imagine the world we could create if we stick together. That is what the germs are looking forward to if Simon never gets rid of them. With that, Simon raised off the bus and did something the germs did not like one bit. I wonder what he's going to do. Simon covered his mouth when he sneezed and coughed and blew his nose with a tissue. Hey, what are you doing? The germs said. We thought we were friends as they're falling into the trash can and the tissue. Then he threw the tissue into the trash can. Well, he's finally learning to now get rid of his germs. Then he went to the sink and washed his hands with warm, soapy water. How could you? The germs said as they're going down the drain, which sent the germs packing. They are gone. Simon rested all weekend. Uh-oh, he's resting and drinking lots of fluids? We don't stand a chance. Is his nose talking? Mom said. I think so, little sister said. By Monday, Simon woke up feeling good as new. He looks healthy now. He doesn't have a runny nose anymore. And it looks like his skin is all cleared up. He was ready to go back to his favorite place in the whole world. And hey, wait for me. I'm not sick anymore. Yay, yay, yippee, hooray. They're all very happy that Simon is not sick anymore. He won't be able to spread his germs anymore. To have the best week ever. Oh, oh, what do you think is gonna happen all over again? All the class is looking at him very scared. Do you think Simon is gonna give him an advice? Let's find out. Go wash your hands. I hope you like this story. It is one of my favorites and I really feel like it reinforces the idea of washing your hands to avoid spreading germs. We will now do an experiment. The things you will need to do this experiment is water, black pepper, a bowl, and dish soap. We will be doing an experiment that will go with our theme for today, which is germs. I will show you how germs do not like soap whatsoever and how soap is very good to prevent ourselves from germs. I will show you my items for this experiment and I am very excited for you to try it at home. You will need black pepper and you can find this at home, just ask your mom for it. You will need a bowl and as you can tell, I'm using a bowl with very clear and clean water and you will need some soap. It doesn't have to be dish soap, it can also be like shampoo or hand soap, whatever you want to use at home, it is perfectly fine. Now, Simon in our story was very responsible and he was spreading his germs everywhere. He was not covering his nose, he was not using a Kleenex, he was not washing his hands or using hand sanitizer, even though he was very sick and he was spreading his germs everywhere. Now, the germs in our experiment are going to be the black pepper. I am now going to pour the black pepper into my nice clear bowl. Let's begin our experiment. The black pepper will represent the germs that Simon was spreading everywhere around the school. As you can tell, my bowl is very clean. No germs are in it. Now, let's be responsible like Simon and spread our germs all around. You wanna get them all around your bowl so you have a good image of germs spread all around. 
I kind of went in a square motion since my, my bowl is square, but if you have a circular one, you can go in a circular motion. We'll go ahead and close it, and let's begin our experiment. Now, my hands are not very clean, so I'm gonna go ahead and dip my finger in the water and get all these germs inside. Now I'm going to get my finger out, and as you can tell, my finger is very gross. I have a lot of germs around my finger. It is now time to test the theory that soap will keep germs away. So now I'm going to go wash my hands with soap and I will show you how my finger reacts to soap and the water with germs. Let's go hands and I also covered my finger with soap to show you. Now I'm going to dip it in the water. Let's see if this works. Wow, did you see how the germs are now staying away from my finger because it is clean and covered with soap? This is what happens when your hands are clean and not dirty. It will keep your germs away. Hello, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson as much as I did. I had a lot of fun giving it to you guys and I hope that what you learned today, you will be able to implement it at home. Just as a reminder, we learned what germs are and we also learned the three simple knockout rules for germs, which is to build your immune system, wash your hands with soap and water, and to keep your germs to yourself. Now, I also really hope that you enjoyed Simon's story and it will benefit you in case you're ever feeling sick at school. Remember that it's important that if you are feeling sick to stay at home to keep others safe. Because as in the story we saw that Simon was spreading all his germs to everybody and then everybody was very sad and sick to the story. Your homework from me to you is to practice this experiment at home and share your knowledge to your loved ones like your parents your siblings or your grandparents i really hope that you will come back next week when we'll be talking about the environment goodbye guys hi friends welcome to our reading corner i'm mrs fletcher a second grade teacher in the osborne school district and I'm super happy to see you today because I have some fun songs and a great book and some cool information to share with you. But first, let's say hello to all of our friends. Let's do a hello song that uses English, Spanish, and sign language. Here we go. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. It's time to say hello. Let's do that one more time. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. It's time to say hello. Round of applause. <laughs> That's fun. So fun. So, you know, every day, we learn different things and it's important that we know the days of the week. Well, I have a song that you can sing along with me that we can learn the seven days of the week. Are you ready? It goes like this. There are seven days, there are seven days, there are seven days a week. There are seven days, there are seven days, there are seven days in a week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Let's do that one more time. There are seven days, there are seven days, there are seven days a week. There are seven days, there are seven days, there are seven days in a week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yay! Round of applause. I know some of you like to move your arms to every song and every word and every uh, beat. You know what? You can move it any way you want. So feel free to join in and get your body going when you sing along. So I have a book that has the days of the week in it, and it's about a mischievous cat named Cookie. That's a sign for Cookie. Cookie. All right, and it's called Cookie's Week by Cindy Ward and Tommy DePaola. Let's pay attention what happens to Cookie. Ooh, blue. That's a fun color. It's kind of like Mrs. Fletcher's sweater. Cookie's Week. Oh, Cookie's peeking out. On Monday, Cookie fell in the toilet. Oh no, that's a terrible way to start on Monday. There was water everywhere. Oh no. On Tuesday, Cookie knocked a plant off the windowsill. Oh, and all those beautiful flowers. There was dirt everywhere. And paw prints. On Wednesday, Cookie upset the trash can. No, Cookie, no. You guessed it. There was garbage everywhere. On Thursday, Cookie got stuck in a kitchen drawer. Ow! That's not good either. <laughs> there were pots and pans and dishes everywhere. On Friday, Cookie ran into the closet before the door closed. Let's see what happens to Cookie. There were clothes everywhere. The shoes, like a hanger, some scarf. Is that a dress? Mm. On Saturday, Cookie climbed the curtains. And Cookie went everywhere. Oh, looks like the curtain rod fell down with the curtains. Tomorrow is Sunday. Hmm. Do you think Cookie's going to do something? Maybe Cookie will rest. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think? I think Cookie's going to get in trouble. Ah, there Cookie goes. The end. I hope you have a great week. Don't get in trouble. All right, so I have a question for you. When the weather gets warm, it makes me start to think of water, you know, and maybe playing outside. Some of us um, have been swimming before or to a lake. Well, it makes me think about some of the creatures that live in the water. And then I think about fish and I think about, wait a minute, why can't fish breathe air? So I turn to my book, National Geographic's Little Kids First Big Book of Why. That's a sign for why. Why? And they talk about why can't fish breathe air? Well, all animals need oxygen to live. And animals that breathe air have lungs that can get oxygen from the air. Fish gills have to be under the water to work because they have to get oxygen from the water. Gills are soft, feathery, frilly organs that float like waving fingers. And without water, they cannot float and they stick together. That means they can't get oxygen. Well, what is this funny guy? So this is a type of salamander. And you can see that the gills are on the outside. He's also called an oxalotl. Some people call them water dogs. And they're cool little creatures, but their gills are on the outside. Isn't that neat? 
and uh, kind of look like a little smiley face. A little smiley face there. Jellyfish do not have gills. They get oxygen through their skin. Hmm, that's cool. And guess what? Look at this creature. This is called the walking catfish. The walking catfish has special gills. It can breathe in water and on land. Hmm. Well, that's a neat little information. So when you're hot and you're thinking about the water, now you can share some cool information with those around you about the axolotl or the little water salamander, water dog, how jellyfish breathe through their skin, and that's right, the walking catfish. Special adapt adaptations to uh, go on land and in water. Oh, friends, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you uh, stopping by and learning some neat things. Remember your songs. Remember, get your brain strong and have a beautiful week. Let's go ahead and do our uh, thank you and goodbye song. Ready? Get your hands out. My hands say thank you with a clap, clap, clap. My feet say thank you with a tap, tap, tap. Clap, clap, clap. Tap, tap. Tap, I roll my hands and say goodbye. All right, let's do our goodbye song. Here we go. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, friends. It's time to say goodbye. Oh, thank you again so much, and uh, I look forward to see you next time in our Reading Corner. This is Mrs. Fletcher, second grade teacher, Osborne School District, saying I hope you have a beautiful week. Bye, friends. news source for science. I'm Joan Bucklew. Here at SN, we are committed to bring you all the current events in science before anyone else, and today is no exception. Due to our excellent investigation research, we have, to track, we have tracked down the germ gang. As you know, not only has this notorious gang been causing chaos in the world for centuries, they have been in the headlines for the past months, and now we here at SN have tracked them down. We have exclusive interviews with all four of the Germ Gang members. Before we go to their undisclosed location, let's review a little of their past. The term germ refers to microscopic organisms. Germ Gang cannot be seen with the human eye, as they are very, very small. This gang is relatively unknown until about 1850, when microscopes were improved upon. Microscopes are instruments used to see very small things because they are magnified or make bigger items that are very small. This explains why the germ gang was able to stay in hiding for so long. But our researchers have them and we are going to get to the real truth directly and get it from the germ's mouth. There are four main members to this ill-famed group. has exclusive interviews with each one of them. Our first interview will be with bacteria. Let's go right to the hidden location and see what bacteria has to say. Bacteria, are you there? Yes, hello. 
I'd like to thank you for giving me an opportunity to explain myself. Lately, I've been hunted. There's nowhere for me to hide. Nowhere is safe. Nowhere. I'm not the bad guy here. Yes. Well, isn't it true that you can make people sick? Our scientists here at SN News are telling me that you can cause cavities, ear infections, and even strep throat. Well, yes, technically that's true. But why look at the negative side? I've also done some really positive stuff. I can be really good for the human body, can be really good for the digestive system. I keep it in good running order. Heck, I'm used to make medicines, vaccines. Everyone has good and bad things about them, right? Tell us about your habitat. Where do you thrive? I'm not sure I should, you know. I'm in hiding. But I can see that would make you uncomfortable, but we want our viewers to know the real you. If they understand you better, then you might find it a little more comfortable to be in, in the world today. Yeah, well, all right. I can live in a hotter or colder place than humans, but I do best in a warm, moist, protein-rich environment. Some examples are soil, water, vegetation, or inside humans and animals. But, um... That's not where I am right now. Now, earlier, you mentioned good and bad parts. How do you, pre how do people prevent the bad part of you? Geez, lady, you're killing me. Now, bacteria. Here at SN, we pride ourselves on giving the full story. Let's not let our viewers down. I guess it's not like it hasn't already been out this whole time. First, you wash your hands before eating, touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. Also, wash your hands after touching anyone who is sneezing, coughing, or blowing their nose. And for Pete's sake, don't share anything like towels, lipstick, toys, or anything else that could be covered in germs. And I guess last, don't share food, liquid, utensils or beverage containers with anyone else. Thank you so much, Bacteria, for this in-depth look into your life. Now, we are moving on to the next member of our germ gang, someone who has really gotten a lot of exposure. Virus? Not him. This is all his fault, because he wants to be famous. Virus, are you there? This is Science News, ready to share your deepest thoughts. Uh, hello everyone. First, I'd like to thank all my fans out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Virus, I hate to break it to you, but you have caused a great deal of serious problems in the world lately. Uh, hey, you know what they say. If you can't be famous, be infamous. Am I right? I'm glad you're not shy. Our viewers are really excited to hear what you have to say. Well, I'm even smaller than bacteria, and I'm not even a full cell. I'm simply genetic material packaged inside of a protein coating, and I need to use another cell structures to reproduce. This means I can't even survive unless I'm living inside something else, like a person, animal, or plant. That is so interesting and very different from bacteria. It's cool, right? So if I do go outside of a living cell, I can only live for a very short time. Yes, well, I don't think our viewers think it's cool. Tell us, how do you get into a host or a living organism? No problemo, easy peasy. You see, people can catch from others who already have me. This happens when someone I have infected sneezes or coughs, sending tiny droplets through the air. I am in those droplets, and I can land in the nose, mouth, or eyes of someone nearby, or be breathed in, or, get this, 
people also can get infected if they touch an infected droplet on the surface and then touch their own nose, mouth, or eyes. So once I move into someone's body, I can spread easily and can make a person sick. I can cause minor illnesses like colds, the flu, and sometimes it can be very serious. So, that's where you get your bad rep. I'm thinking that keeping you off the streets includes the same things as bacteria I was discussing with washing hands and obviously staying away from people who are already sick with you. Why would anyone want to do that? Yeah, they need to stay away from those things so I can latch myself to the good cells in the body and take a joy ride. I don't think your host sees it that way or sees any joy in it. Well, there you have it folks, straight from the virus's mouth. We still need to hear from our less known germ gang members, fungi and protozoa. Let's go there now. Good morning, germs. Let our viewers know a little bit about yourselves as they don't know much. Yeah, that's because bacteria and virus get all the paparazzi. Where's my paparazzi? Everything is about them. I'm important too. I might not make someone really sick, but I can cause a really bad itch. Is that so? Tell us more. Okay. I like that I'm finally getting some attention. Well, I live in damp, warm environments, and unlike Virus, who doesn't even have an entire cell, I'm multi-celled. And get this, plant-like. Me, I get nutrition from plants, food, and animals. Can you give us some examples of exactly what you do? Yeah, sure. I can cause athlete's foot, eye infections, ew, and nail infections. I'm one tough dude. Well, we can see that. Now, protozoa, you've been very quiet this whole time. Our viewers want to know your story too. I don't like all this attention, but here it goes. I'm like bacteria because I'm a one-celled organism, but I'm a bit bigger. I'm like virus in the way that sometimes I need to live on or in another organism. What is original about me is that I am commonly spread through contaminated water. I really like moisture, so often I can be found in the gut and I create quite an infection. I see. And how is it that you can be prevented? Drinking clean water. Baby, you want me around. You want to keep that moisture on your sweaty feet so I can get them all itchy for you. I think what fungi means to say is keep skin clean and dry and that will keep them away. Well folks, thanks to our deep investigative report, we can finally take the germ gang off the streets. Now let's go to our cooking segment with Chef. Chef, I understand you have an activity to do at home that helps us understand germs. Thank you, Joan. Yes, we have a potato activity, so you can see germs hard at work. First, we're going to wash our hands. As you just learned from the germ gang, the way to keep them away is to keep things clean. We're gonna peel a raw potato, and we have knives, but uh, maybe have an adult supervision if you want to use a knife. So we're just gonna peel a potato, nice long pieces. Maybe see if you can try to get the longest peeling. I don't think I'm very good at that. And then we're going to cut it in half. And again, make sure safety first. Ask for uh, some supervision or some help. I'm going to cut your potato. Okay, you have two halves. So you're going to take one and you're going to pass around to your family. Don't wash your hands first. Just Touch it, throw it, toss it to each other, play hot potato if you want. Then you're gonna put one of the halves into a bag. Just like this, little zip like that. Just like you use for lunch. Okay, all right. There's the one that everybody passed around. Okay, and then you're gonna wash your hands. 
And then you're gonna take the other potato and put it in the other bag. Okay. Okay. All right, and then we're gonna label them washed and unwashed. Okay, it doesn't have to look perfect. <laughs> There's your wash and then unwashed. All right, permanent marker works best. Okay, and then you're gonna put them in a dark closet, leave it at room temperature, and then after a week, you're gonna pull the bags out and take a look at the potato pieces. But don't take them out of the bag. Uh, be your own scientist and discuss the different pieces, uh, which potato has the most growth, what do you see, and why. Share this with your family, and when you're done examining the results, throw the potatoes away. And that's all I have for today. Remember, be inquisitive. And back to you, Joan. <laughs> Thank you, Chef. That looks fun. That's it for today. Join us next time for a special on environments. Goodbye from all of us here at Science News. And remember, stay interested. Hi there, I'm Mrs. Netherow and I teach sixth grade at Sunland Elementary in the Roosevelt School District. Today I'm going to guide you in thinking just like a scientist so we can learn more about germs. First we're going to brainstorm what we already know about germs and we're going to ask ourselves some questions. Then we're going to learn from a subject matter expert through a read aloud that's titled A Germ's Journey. And finally, we're gonna use everything we learned and the questions we developed to design an at-home science experiment. Let's get started thinking like a scientist. Scientists are constantly making observations. What do you see? What do you notice? What do you observe? Those observations, along with facts and information, help scientists to generate questions. So what I wanna know first is, what do you think you know about germs? Using the background knowledge you have in your head from your own experiences or maybe things you've read or heard, what do you know about germs? For example, I know germs can be good and they can be bad. And when I asked my sixth grade students this question, some other responses I got were, germs are spread from one place to another and they're spread quite easily. I heard germs can make us cough and sneeze. We often have germs covering our hands. And I also heard from some students that they think germs are mostly found in public places. We have these thoughts, we have these facts, we have this information, and now as scientists, we need to take it to generate questions. So now my question for you is, what do you wonder about germs? What kind of curiosities do you have? So I'm wondering, how are germs formed? How are they created? And some of the things my sixth graders again were wondering, shout out to the scorpions, uh, they were wondering, why do germs move so easily from one place to another? Lastly, a question we're gonna focus very heavily on for the remainder of this lesson is, where are germs 
mostly found? Where can you find the largest amounts of germs? At the start of this lesson, we began by talking about what we already know about germs. Maybe that was our background knowledge or other facts and information we had learned about germs from things we had heard or read. We also talked about the questions we have in regards to germs, the things we're curious about, the things we wonder. Before we transition to a read aloud, a germs journey that will focus more on where exactly germs can be found, I want to make sure that we have a solid definition and understanding of exactly what germs are. Take a look at your television screen. There you will see a definition. Feel free to read along with me. A germ is a microorganism that can make you sick. They can be found almost anywhere. Four very common forms of germs are bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses. I do want to point out, before we transition to our read aloud, that our definition says a germ is a microorganism that can make you sick. Germs don't always make us sick. And I do want us to know that germs are good and bad. Also, take a look, and again, I want to reiterate, germs can be found just about anywhere. Where do you think your last cold came from? And when you sneezed, where do you think all of those germs went? We all know germs can make you sick. And we know germs are found just about everywhere. I had a sixth grader say germs are found mostly in public. But I'm wondering, is that true? Exactly where do we find germs? This book is going to help us better understand that question. Where are germs found? A Germ's Journey, written by Tom Rook. As I read this story to you, I want you to think about where germs are found. We'll talk about it at the end. A Germ's Journey by Tom Rook, MD. He's our subject matter expert. He knows what he's talking about as far as germs go. And this is also illustrated by Tom Tony Trimmer. This is Rudy. Rudy feels rotten. He has a cold. Colds are caused by tiny creatures called germs. And right now, millions of germs are living inside Rudy's nose. Many types of germs can make you sick. Examples include bacteria, mold, fungi, and viruses. Colds are usually caused by viruses called rhinoviruses. The cold germs inside Rudy's nose are multiplying. They're running out of room and need a new home. Another nice, warm nose would be perfect. Pardon me. Crowded, isn't it? The germs tickle Rudy's nose and trigger a, uh, uh, excuse me, let's blow out of this place. Sneeze! Rudy forgot to use a tissue. His cold germs fly across the room at more than 100 miles an hour. I can fly! Whee! Best ride ever! A few germs land on Ernie. But skin acts like a suit of armor. It protects against harm. The germs won't find a new home there. So I'm going to stop and pause for a minute. So far, when I'm thinking about where we can find germs, it doesn't have a ton to do with whether we're in our own space, our home, or the public. It has to do with how they travel and how they spread from one person to another. And this germ, these germs, have started in Rudy's nose, and now they're on Ernie's skin. Healthy skin keeps germs out, but germs can sneak into the body through cuts, scrapes, or cracks in the skin. Most germs enter through a person's mouth or nose. Rudy's germs continue to fall on nearly everything in the room, including Brenda's candy. Brenda can't see the germs, and she's hungry. Are the germs going to make her sick? I think we found a new place to party! Not today! Brenda peels off the wrapper and throws it away. The germs wind up in the trash, not in her mouth. Was it something we said? Germs that land on floors, desks, or tissues usually dry up quickly and die. But some germs can live on objects for days. 
So those germs from Rudy aren't just in his nose or on Ernie's arms, on his skin any longer. The germs are also on the floor, on the desk, and in tissues. Now, a usual rhinovirus, the germs dry up quickly. But COVID-19, the coronavirus that's in our current events now, it sticks around a little longer than the usual virus. Eve is going to give an apple to her teacher. Apples are supposed to be healthy snacks, but this one might make Eve's teacher sick. An apple a day keeps the germies away. Wait. Eve's teacher washes her apple before she eats it. The germs roll off and swirl down the drain. Soap kills germs. So do hand sanitizers and antiseptics, such as rubbing alcohol. Hand washing is the best way to keep germs from spreading. I think this is important additional information. It is more effective to wash your hands with hot water and soap for two happy birthdays than it is for a quick pump of sanitizer. So make sure that you do the hand washing first and then use the hand sanitizer as a backup option. Some of Rudy's germs land on the classroom computer. When Chip touches the keyboard, the germs stick to his fingers. All right, guys, I'm paying attention now because we sure do touch computers and iPads and other devices quite often. Here we have the germs on the classroom computer. Type G-E-R-M. You're going to get a C-O-L-D. S-I-C-K spells sick. Chip didn't wash his hands after using the computer. He touches the doorknob the pencil sharpener, his homework, he even touches the globe. Now France is contaminated with germs. This is the perfect illustration of how easily germs spread. A shared computer, to doorknobs, which everyone touches, the pencil sharpener, homework, which gets passed from students to teachers, and the globe. Oh no, ooh la la. Yikes. Now, here comes Jared. He types at the keyboard Chip just used, and the germs are on the move again. There are 400 times more germs on desktops and computer keyboards, your iPad 2, or your Chromebook, than there are on most toilet seats. Did you hear that? Your device has 400 times more germs than the toilet seat in your home. Then Jared rubs his eyes. That's bad. Mmm, this place might work. He bites his fingernails. That's even worse. Love the high ceiling. And he picks his nose. Home sweet home. Rudy's cold germs are now inside Jared's nose. They multiply quickly. Ugh. Turn up the music. Hey, hey, parte. Did anyone bring chips? And soon the millions of germs will run out of room. They will spread to Jared's throat and lungs, and Jared will have a terrible cold. Jared doesn't feel sick yet, but he can still spread germs, especially if he doesn't cover his mouth. <coughs> Jared's germs fly through the bus. Yuck! They land on Connor's backpack and Skye's lunchbox. They land on empty seats and the bus driver's head. And Britley yawns. <laughs> and the germs fly into her mouth. The germs find new homes, miles from school. And they don't stop there. They travel to dance class, piano lessons, and baseball games. They travel to restaurants and birthday parties even to movies. Tonight, Jared finds out he is leaving this weekend to visit his grandmother in Ohio. The germs that started with Rudy in Rudy's nose are off on a brand new adventure. There is no cure for a common cold. Cold germs will disappear on their own, usually in a week or two. So we asked ourselves as we started this story, where specifically do germs live? And we have so many ideas now that we'll talk about in just a minute. 
Now that we've just finished reading A Germ's Journey, let's think about two questions. How and why do germs transport so easily? And where are germs found? When we look at this visual representation of the story we just read, we see Rudy at the top and in the center. He's our character who began the story. He had the millions of germs within his nose. And as we look more closely at this diagram, we see a number of green arrows. These arrows point to different people and different objects. Those green arrows represent the transport of germs from him to them. I want to challenge you to retell where the germs began in Rudy's nose and all of the places that they traveled to after he sneezed. On this next slide, we see those same objects in word form. And we see the question, where are germs transported or where are germs found? The list you see on this screen is not a complete list of all of the people that Rudy's germs were transported to or all of the surfaces and objects that they were transported to. What we should have a firm grasp and understanding of is that germs are everywhere. Using our background knowledge and the facts and information we gained from a germs journey, I'm pretty confident in saying Germs are everywhere. They're in public and in our homes. And germs are transported very, very easily. So as we move on to the last piece of our time together today, we're going to set up an at-home science experiment that helps us determine where the germiest places in our homes really are. To complete this at-home science experiment, we're gonna be using bread, preferably a lighter color of bread, and if possible, a bread that's not super duper processed. We're also going to need Ziploc bags that will be sealed. And you're going to need something to label with so you know what the contents of each bag are. In this at-home science experiment, we're going to be taking a slice of bread, and we're going to be contaminating this bread with the germs from other objects. But before we contaminate three slices of bread, what we need to make sure we do is keep every single thing about this test exactly the same, except for our one independent variable. I'm gonna make sure that I use tongs when I'm touching this bread. And the reason for that is because I know from our read aloud and from my own background knowledge that our hands are covered in germs. I have one piece of bread here. I'm using tongs to keep it from being contaminated. And I'm going to put this slice of bread into the Ziploc. I'm gonna do my best not to touch it. And I'm going to seal it into the bag. This is going to serve as our control. A control is used to compare and contrast the results or the dependent variable as our scientific testing comes to an end. So now, again, we're gonna keep in mind that every single thing needs to stay the same, except for my one independent variable, the one thing that I change. So again, taking my tongs, taking a piece of bread, and doing my best to not contaminate this with my hands. Well, for this one, my independent variable is my dirty hands. So now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna to touch this bread front and back, with my hands that have not been washed recently. I'm gonna put it back in the tongs and I'm gonna place it in the bag. Now I'm going to seal this. We have our control, we have our sterile bread. And now we had starting with the control and the only thing I added to it was an independent variable of my dirty hands. Moving on to the next one. This time, we're going to be testing the face of a phone. I've heard the face of a phone is extremely dirty and full of so many germs. I'm gonna take the bread, keeping it my control, using my tongs to keep it from being contaminated. And the next thing I need to do is I need to take the face of the phone and wipe it with both sides of the bread. 
I want to get the germs from the phone onto the bread. There is my next independent variable. I'm placing it into the bag and I'm sealing it. And I'm making sure that it's getting labeled so there is no confusion with the independent variables. The last independent variable I want to test, because the story of germs journey mentioned the germs on a floor, I'm assuming there's a lot of germs on the sole of a shoe, especially the sole of a toddler's shoe. So I'm gonna take this shoe and place it here, taking the bag, opening it up, and again, getting a sterile piece of bread, one that has yet to be contaminated, I'm gonna place it on top of this baggie first so no germs from the table contaminate it. And then I'm gonna take my son's shoe and I'm gonna stomp it on top of that piece of bread. I'm going to flip it over with my clean tongs. Again, I don't want to get my hand germs on here. And I'm going to do the same. Again, you should be noticing that everything was exactly the same with all of my tests except the one independent variable that I changed. Now that I've modeled this at-home science experiment for you with a control and three independent variables, I want you to think back to a germ's journey. I want you to think back to all of the specific locations that you know germs are found. They're found everywhere. But think of three specific places you're curious about and interested in. And then go take that clean piece of bread, swab it on those locations, and place them inside a Ziploc bag. Again, this particular experiment is going to take some time. It's going to take possibly a couple of weeks before you see any results. Still continue to monitor the different variables, the different tests, each day, take a look at what you see, take a look at what you notice, take a look at what you observe, but be patient. Be patient with the results because eventually you should see that some locations in your home are dirtier, they're germier than other locations. Thank you for spending the last 20 minutes with me. If you only learned two things today, I hope you learned germs are transported so easily and they're found everywhere, in public and in our homes. Remember to stay safe, stay healthy, and don't forget that you are incredibly missed by all of your teachers. Take care, see you again. Hi, and welcome to the seventh and eighth grade science my name is Mrs. Carlson, and I'm from Irene Lopez School in the Roosevelt School District. Yay! So let's get started. Today we're going to talk about germs. For this first activity, you're going to need a pencil and a paper. So go ahead and grab that. And I'm going to set our timer to three minutes. In these three minutes, I want you to think about and list where are germs located. So think about all the places you can in thinking of where germs are located. And number two is how can we prevent the spread of germs? So again, make sure you have a pencil and a paper. You're gonna take three minutes and reflect on the two questions and write them down. have about two minutes. Number one started with a complete sentence, germs are located. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the list goes on. And number two, think about how you can do your part. How can you prevent the spread of germs? have about a minute and a half.
and adding to your list, think about all the things you happen to touch in the day before you wash your hands next. Right now, a lot of us are being affected by the coronavirus. When we think about how can we prevent the spread of germs, I hope that you're writing, washing your hands, staying indoors, wearing a mask when you're out in public. What are the other ways you can think of for us to prevent the spread of germs? You have about 30 seconds to wrap up your thinking. about 15 seconds, go ahead and get that last idea on this paper. Finalize your sentence, find a good stopping point. And that is my timer. Thank you for completing the quick write. Now that we might have gotten freaked out about all the places that we have spread germs, uh, let's talk a little bit about what are germs and what are ways we can prevent germs from continuing to spread. So germs are found everywhere. They're found in air, water, food, soil, even on you. There are various types of germs, but most germs are actually not harmful to you. And that's because your body has an immune system that fights things off. So for example, when you get really hot outside and you sweat, that is your body trying to cool you off. Your body is built to fight off things like germs. What gets a little scary is that viruses can be harmful because they carry diseases and they need a host like you to survive. So when we talk about things like COVID-19, it's a harmful virus because it carries that disease and it, it can even kill people. And so what we wanna talk about today is, well, how can we prevent germs from continuing to spread? How can we do our part? So today we're really gonna think about and visualize germs spreading and what are effects of soap and hand sanitizer in preventing the spread. So milk is going to act as our base of the objects or even ourselves when germs are spreading. We're gonna use food coloring to represent the variety of germs. You're going to need soap and hand sanitizer and some Q-tips as our applicators. So go ahead and start looking around your house for those things. I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer for two minutes. Again, I want you looking around your house for milk, food coloring, soap, hand sanitizer, and Q-tips. You have two minutes to go find. If you realize you're missing something, go ahead and write this stuff down on that piece of paper that we had. So next time your family goes to the grocery store, maybe you can buy one of these things or you can just watch along with us. Go ahead and start setting those up on your table. 
Make sure you also have your paper and your pencil still handy. And that is our time. All right, before we get started, let's talk about types of variables. So an independent variable is the variable you are changing to test the experiment. The dependent variable is the responding variable, so it's the response to what it is you are changing. I think about it as it's what you measure. And make sure you set controls for your experiment, because every time you restart an experiment and test a different variable, you need to make sure that you set it up to be fair and accurate results. Scientists are able to repeat the results before they share it with the community. Our testable question is how does soap versus hand sanitizer help diminish germs? So my independent variable would be the soap versus the hand sanitizer. Those are the two products I'm changing. And then the effect is going to be how quickly does it diminish or get rid of these germs? All right, before we get started with testing, let's make a hypothesis and inference. So go ahead and grab that pencil and that paper. I'm going to give us two minutes, and here's how we're going to start it. If you use dish soap or hand sanitizer, I need you to pick one, then the germs will diminish quicker because, <laughs> and here's where I need your genius scientists to really think of a reason. What is my inference? I'm going to go ahead and give you two minutes. So if you use do you think dish soap is going to be better or do you think hand sanitizer is going to be better to diminish the germs? So write one in your sentence. Then the germs will diminish quicker because what is your reasoning? We have about a minute and a half. Why is one product better than the other? Try to use your observations to help you with your inference. Is it the way it feels? The way it smells? Has, is it a personal experience? Have you seen a difference in when you use soap versus hand sanitizer? And I want you to write about that in your hypothesis with your infants. You have about one minute. Thirty seconds. Again, you're selecting one independent variable in your reasoning. Five seconds. And that is my timer. Go ahead and share your hypothesis and your inference with a family member. Now that you've shared your hypothesis and inference, I'm gonna go ahead and share mine. So I'm gonna say, if you use dish soap, then the germs will diminish quicker because other scientists and health officials have declared using hand soap would be the number one use and second would be hand sanitizer. I infer this because when you use hand soap, you need to make sure you spread it well, and you're also using water to be able to spread the hand soap and then diminish those germs. So the fact that you're using both water and soap and you're really letting the soap soak in, I infer that dish soap will be more effective than hand sanitizer. Okay, so in order to do this experiment, you're going to need milk as your base. So I'm gonna go ahead and put milk in the bowl. You're also going to need, we're going to compare our hand sanitizer to our soap. I have three different food colorings, and then I have some Q-tips as our applicators. 
So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna go ahead and put a couple of dots of food coloring to represent our germs. Think about all the things you touch today. All the different germs you might be carrying. And I encourage you, if you have a timer on your phone, to go ahead and time and see how fast can the soap spread out and clean up our germs. So I'm using the Q-tip to go ahead and dip and just get some soap on there. And now let's test it out. Whoa. See how fast it's spread out? Doing the same with blue on the opposite side. And that was with all within seconds. Same thing with green. And if I was to use the clean side, it would be even better. Now we're gonna reset to see how fast hand sanitizer works. Remember in an experiment, you need to have a control. So here the milk is gonna to be to the same level. I'm going to put my drops of food coloring throughout. I'm gonna get a new clean Q-tip, dip it in my hand sanitizer. And then with your timer, let's go ahead and see how fast you get these to spread. So it quickly spreads and it spreads pretty far, but if we compare it to our soap, our time was a little faster with the soap, but it still has almost as great and I can go anywhere and it's leaving a really clean effect. You've seen my experiment and hopefully you're using a timer to time out how fast it was diminishing the germs. When you replicate, I want you to make sure if you have a brother or a sister or if you're really good at multitasking and you can time as well as doing the experiment, I really want you to, to make sure you have accurate results and make sure that you're timing your experiment because even though I made the hypothesis and I uh, inferred dish soap, I have to be able to prove those results. Was that true or not? Was that accurate? And I'm going to need to communicate that. And that is totally okay if what you hypothesized and inferred didn't end up being the result. Scientists need to share honest and accurate data. So on the left hand side, soap and hand sanitizer, remember those are our independent variables. Those are on the left hand side that I put here. And then I made a data table. I figured there was two different ways I can measure this or two different ways that I have my, I can represent my dependent variables. So I can measure time, how quickly did it diminish those germs, or I can measure how far did it spread. I can grab a ruler and see how far away did those germs just diminish and move away from where we applied the soap. If you wanna test both ways, you can set it up to be two different experiments, and if you wanna repeat it, even better. After you experiment and you've analyzed your data, the last thing we need to do is really interpret that data. Which cleaning product was quickest in diminishing the germs? Which cleaning product removed the germs farther? Can both products be useful or is one better than the other and why? So when I first was making my hypothesis, I was telling you guys that uh, the medical experts out there are saying to use dish soap when you can, or sorry, hand soap when you can, uh, but if you do not have that available, hand sanitizer is the next best thing. So do you find that to be true? Are they both equally useful? Why? Use your evidence. I wanna thank you guys for joining me today. I hope you had fun, and I really hope that you share this information with a friend um, on social media with permission, text it out, send it to family. Enjoy and make sure you share those results and you do your part in helping uh, 
um, diminish the germs and not spreading COVID-19. One last thing I want to do is be a good digital citizen. So that means I share my resources when I use something online. Uh, so I want to share with you guys this cool little coronavirus slideshow I made is found on Slides Carnival. So if you're going to share this with your friends, create your own presentation on it, check out Slides Carnival. Alright guys, see you next week when we talk about the environment. Make sure to stay safe and do your part. Wash your hands. Bye. You've been watching Phoenix TV's Study Hall. Brought to you by District 8 and our partners at Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts. Tune in Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. for more study hall. I hope you learned something today and keep up the great work.